Hey, 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 once again, this is Dr. Lloyd D. Kinlow II, Pastor Lloyd D. Kinlow II, Lloyd D. Kinlow II, or as I always say, uh, for those of you who knew me many, many years ago, simply David Kinlow. Uh, I pray that um, your soul is prospering, even as you are prospering in health. And uh, we pray once again you had a joyous Christmas celebration season. And we're praying God's many blessings, primarily spiritually, upon you or for you in 2024. All right. I would like to talk to you uh, whenever you're listening to this. Could be morning, could be afternoon, could be evening or late night concerning the incarnation of God, the incarnation of God. And so first of all, what does the word incarnate mean? Well, the word incarnate is from the Latin word incarnatus. It literally means made flesh or to embody in flesh. In the context of the person of Christ, it means the embodiment of God or the enfleshment of God. It means God embodying himself in human flesh or God taking upon himself a human nature but never ceasing to be God. The incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. When I say that it is an essential doctrine, what I mean is it is an absolute necessity for people to be saved or delivered from sin and all of its consequences, including the guilt of sin, the penalty of sin, the power of sin over one's life, and in the eternity to come, total deliverance from the very presence of sin. And so the incarnation of God in the person of Christ, it is a necessary doctrine to be believed and therefore confessed to spend one's eternity in the conscious presence of God upon physical death and eventually in the new heaven and in the new earth where God will dwell amongst redeemed men and we will be in glorified spiritual bodies pneumatica somis Paul says it, the Greek says it uh, just like the body Jesus had after he was raised from the dead the body he possesses as I speak unless one believes and confesses this truth um, personally, they cannot be saved. For apart from God incarnating himself in human flesh, or taking upon himself a human nature, but never ceased to be God, we are lost and in our sins. And we are doomed to an eternity in the place of outer darkness, the place of weeping, wailing, and the gnashing of teeth, the place Jesus likened unto a furnace of fire that is never quenched. God had to embody himself in the person of Christ in order to die for our sins. In order for Jesus to die for our sins, he had to be truly human. A true human being Flesh, blood, bones, hair, um, the, the double helix DNA strand, um, the XY chromosome. He had to be truly human to die for our sins. But also, in order for his sacrifice for us to be perfect, 
It had to be just as perfect as God is perfect. Believe it or not, it is it is contrary to God's nature for him to accept that which is not as perfect as he is. And I know most wouldn't understand that today because most uh, know very little about the holiness of God. And so Christ had to be truly human to die for our sins. But his death, his sacrifice, had to be as perfect as God is perfect. And therefore, he was God. He was God embodied in human flesh. He was God who took upon himself a sin nature, but never ceased to be God. He died on the cross for our sins and perfectly paid up our sin debt in full. He totally satisfied the wrath of God against sinful man, against us. And because he was also truly God, his death was perfectly and infinitely effective in redeeming sinful humans, such as all of you out there, inclusive of me, David Kinlow. And so, what moved me to talk about this subject? Well, what moved me to take up this subject and uh, make a personal statement concerning it was and is the error and false teaching, heresy on the various social media concerning this subject. And the seriousness of this is whenever there is doctrinal error in relationship to the essentials of the Christian faith, the consequences are most grave. And I say that because when we begin to tamper with the essentials of the Christian faith, we are dealing with matters of eternal import or significance. Issues such as salvation, heaven, and hell. And that is as serious as it can get. And far it transcends greatly any other issues that are going upon in this earth and in our lives. Salvation, heaven, and hell, at the end of the day, those things trump everything. And so when we begin to tamper with the essentials of the Christian faith, we're dealing with grave matters in the extreme. And Paul spoke of this in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. It reads like this. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. But he says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes out and proclaims another Jesus, then the one we proclaim, or if you received a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accepted another gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And so, serious issues here. Somebody preaching another Jesus, and then you trusting it, you're trusting in a false Jesus. A false Jesus cannot deliver you from your sins. A false Jesus cannot intercede between you and the Father, forever making intercession for you. And so, very serious. And uh, one of the individuals you can see on YouTube teaching gross error or heresy concerning the incarnation of God in Christ. He has a huge following. He claims to be an apostle because he claims he has personally seen the Lord Jesus Christ or Jesus personally appear to him. 
And he makes this arrogant and I believe ignorant statement, and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment, in contradiction to what we clearly read in the scriptures that dogmatically teach us the last one to whom the risen Christ appeared was the Apostle Paul, and there will be no more. And so Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain, or they are alive, uh, but some have fallen asleep or died. Then he says, after that he appeared to James, Jesus, younger half-brother, and, and then to the apostles, and then Paul makes this statement. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. When Paul wrote the phrase, and last of all, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, the word he used for the term last is the Greek adjective eschatos. The word means the final item in a series of events or actions. It means the last in an overall series of an event. And so, Paul is very specific here. And so, there was a preordained number of appearances of Christ to individuals and groups after Christ was bodily raised from the dead and the last in the series of appearances was he appeared to the Apostle Paul. The same Greek word is used to describe Christ as the last eschatos Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it reads like this. So it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul. The last Adam, it's, 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 it's speaking of Christ, became a life-giving spirit. The Holy Spirit moved Paul to call Christ the last Adam. Just as Paul was the last one to whom the Lord appeared, Christ was the last Adam. Same Greek word, eschatos or eschatos. And so in view of this, there was a series of two Adams that are instrumental in our salvation that appeared upon this earth. The first was Adam, as recorded in Genesis 1 through 2. And then Christ was the last Adam. Eschatos, eschatos. There will not be another Adam in God's redemptive plan. There will be no third Adam. Because the Greek word eschatos, eschatos, last means the last. In a series of events, no more are coming. That's what the Greek word means. And so, um, in the same way, there were a series of appearances to Christ, to individuals and groups. Paul said, and last of all, he appeared to me. Real simple stuff here. And so, since one of the requirements to be an apostle is you, you, you had to have seen the risen Lord, 1 Corinthians 9, 1, Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? And the last in the series of appearances of, of the race and the dead son of God was to Paul, there be no more apostles. Because I don't care who you are, the Lord did not appear to you. Why? Because Paul uses a very specific Greek word, eschatos, eschatos. 
the last to appear in a series of appearances. And because of that, there be no more apostles. And that's why I often say, in light of that, all who claim to be an apostle and claim to have personally seen Christ as proof, they be not an apostle at all. But they be either ignorant, a heretic, or a combination of both. And so I went through all of this to say this. This self-professed apostle on YouTube has a huge following. He is one of the primary prominent heretics who don't have a clue as to the essential Christian doctrine of the incarnation of God in Jesus the Messiah and Savior. And he is misleading, misleading multitudes into spiritual shipwreck and hell, probably with himself. And so, um, I think his church is in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And I'm also moved to teach on the incarnation of God in his son because every Christian needs to understand this essential doctrine in order to fulfill 1 Peter 3.15. It reads like this. <coughs> but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and fear, a reverence, and it's a reverence unto God. And so in view of these two things, a lot of heresy being taught out there about the incarnation of God, and it is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith, and then as Christians, we all need to be able to give an answer on what the incarnation of God in Christ, what it really is. Every Christian. And to be honest, it starts at the pulpit. If you are a pastor, Somewhere along the line, you need to teach your, your, your congregants about the incarnation of God in Christ because it is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. All right, in the history of the church, there have been numerous false teachings concerning the nature of the incarnation of God in Christ. There was something called Ebionism, 107 A.D., Ebionism, or Ebonism, or Ebionism, I'm going to pronounce it like that, was the denial of the incarnation of God in Christ. Instead, it taught at Jesus' baptism, he received a special fullness of the Spirit that enabled him to function in the supernatural realm. But he was not God incarnate in a real human man. And so it really teaches Jesus just had this supercharging of the Holy Spirit. And that's why he was able to walk on water, raise the dead, etc., etc. But at the end of the day, he really wasn't God incarnate in human flesh. There was something called Serinthianism. Serinthianism was a heresy developed by the Gnostic Serinthius in the 1st and 2nd century A.D. And similar to Ebionism, um, Serenthius taught there was no divine nature embodied in the person of Christ. But once again, Christ did receive a special endowment of the Spirit at his baptism by John. So very similar to the first one I gave, gave to you. There was something called Docetism. Docetism was a heresy that developed before the end of the first century A.D. And we even read about this in the epistle of 1st John. And this heresy taught there was no incarnation of God in human flesh. Because they said Jesus was not a real human man at all. But he was some kind of phantom or ghost. That merely appeared to be a man. And the apostle John was quite harsh in shooting this false teaching down. Because if Christ was not a real human person, he could not have died for our sins. That's a problem. There was something called Arianism in the 4th century A.D. 
Arianism was a heretical view concerning the person of Christ developed by a false teacher named Arius. And he was an elder in the church in Alexandria, Egypt. He did not believe God incarnated himself in the person of Christ, but instead he believed and taught a lesser God, incarnating himself in the person of Christ. This, of course, are the ancient roots of the present Jehovah's Witnesses or the Watchtower, whom have butchered John 1.1, 1, 1, butchered the Greek in John 1.1 1, 1 by saying, in the beginning was the word and the word, uh, was with God, and the word was, they say, a God. They add a definite article A in there that's not in the Greek language. And so they say, a God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten, full of grace and truth. There was another one called Apollarianism. Um, Apollarianism was developed by a bishop in the church in Laodicea in the 4th century AD. His name was uh Apollin Apollinarius, I'm sorry, he denied God incarnating himself in a full human because he believed and taught Jesus was only three-fourths human. Thus Christ was not truly God and truly human. He was truly God and three-fourths of a human being. Where people come up with this stuff, I do not know, but they do. There was something called Nestorianism. This particular view of the incarnation of God in Christ came from a bishop in the church in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. His name was Nestorius. And his heretical view of the incarnation of Christ was the belief that by separating the two natures of Christ, the nature of God and the nature of sinless man, Christ was actually two persons in the body, in the human body of Jesus Christ. And so he taught Jesus and, and Jesus and the God in him were two different persons. In other words, uh, there was God who existed eternally. And then there was a separate person in there, Jesus, who came into existence through the womb of Mary. And... I can't recall, but that, that, that sounds like a particular uh, clinical mental illness. You know, you got multiple personalities in you. And so this is a similar group taught by this certain apostle I was referring to. That, you know, Jesus uh, didn't exist before he was born. But God took up residence in this Jesus who was born in Bethlehem. And so there were, he was literally two separate persons. Um, it, is, it is one of the most crass of heresies that assaults the incarnation of God in Christ. And once again, we're talking about serious stuff here. There was another one called Eutychianism. This false view was taught by a man named uh, Eutychus. He was an abbot. An abbot is the chief monk in a monastery of Constantinople in the 5th century AD. He denied the integrity of the incarnation. And the word integrity means completeness and perfection. And so he denied the integrity or the completeness and perfection of the God in human nature um, in Christ. In other words, he taught when Christ took upon himself a human nature in Christ, it diminished both his divine and human natures and formed some kind of a third nature. A third nature that was not truly the nature of God nor truly the nature of man. In other words, Christ was some form of mutant being. And then last, there is the orthodox view of the incarnation. In the orthodox view of the incarnation of God and the person of Christ, it is what we clearly read in the scriptures regarding the embodiment of God in Christ. 
it is this. In the incarnation of God, in the one person of Christ, God took upon himself a human nature, but never ceased to be God. Thus, the one person named Jesus, Yeshua, Jehovah says, he was one person who possessed two distinct natures, a divine nature or the nature of God and the nature of a sinless man. Therefore, he was truly man and truly God. In the Greek, we would say he was the God man, Theos Anthropos and Anthropos Theo. He was the God man and the man God. One person, he had two distinct natures, the nature of God and the nature of sinless humanity. These two natures were and are right now organically and indissolubly united, yet no third nature is formed. These two natures of Christ that resulted from the incarnation of God in Christ they hold their integrity. In other words, both Christ's divine and his human nature, they are complete and they are perfect. Christ's two natures, they are not to be divided or confused. In other words, Jesus did not walk around sometimes as God and sometimes as a human. Nor was he at times in a contradiction between his two natures. In other words, there never was a time when Jesus had a conversation with his God nature or his God nature had a conversation with his human nature and there was contradiction there. No, uh-uh, not so. Christ's two natures did not confound his thinking for each nature was complete and perfect yet organically and indissolubly united in one person, the person of Jesus Christ. Let's look at this in the Holy Scriptures. God embodying himself in human flesh necessitates his pre-existence as the eternal God of the universe. So in order for God to embody himself in human flesh, it means he had to exist before he embodied himself in human flesh. And so Jesus' pre-existence as the God over all things it is what we read in John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The term word there is the Greek word logos, meaning the ultimate communication or expression. The word of the logos or the ultimate expression and communication was in the beginning with God. In other words, when the beginning began, the word, the Logos, was already there. Before time began, or before time was brought into existence um, by God, the word, the Logos, was there. Since the word of the Logos had, has no beginning and no ending, he, he has to be God. The same word or logos that was eternal for the word was there when the beginning was with God. You know, the same word, um, um, he was with God. Same verse. In the beginning he was there, he was with God. He was with God. Um, the word was occurs three times in this verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, three times. Um, this word is in the imperfect sense in the Greek language, meaning a continuous existence. So when you keep reading the word was, it's in the imperfect sense. What it means is the Word was, all, was always there, eternally. And so this word exists in the eternal present. No beginning, no ending. The word of the Logos that was with God and was God just always is. The word with in the phrase 
uh, and the word was with God is the Greek word pros, meaning a separate personality from God. So when it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, pros, it's making a distinction between God and the word, as far as person is concerned. And so the word was a separate person from God. The word with, or it's the Greek word pros, it also presents the picture of being on an equal plane with God. He was with God. On an equal plane with God. Equal with God. The word was equal with God. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, 5-6 through six, virtually states the same. It reads this way. Have this way of thinking in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although existing... <clears throat> In the form of God, who although existing, the Greek word, hupakaro, in the present tense, means he always existed. He always existed in the form of God. The word form there is the Greek word morph. It literally means the exact representation or appearance of a thing or a person. And so when Paul says, let this mind be in you, that was also in Christ Jesus, who although existing forever in the form of God or existing as the exact representation of God, that shows equality. Because for one to be the exact representation or appearance of God, you have to be God. For no created thing can be exactly like God, for God is not a created being. So in order for Christ to be the exact representation of the Father, and the Father is uncreated, the Son also had to be uncreated because he is the exact image or representation of God. He's on an equal plane with God, his Father. And so we all, we, we all hopefully you know, the doctrine of the Trinity, and yes, I know the word is not in the Bible, but neither is the word Bible, but you don't have a problem with that. But it simply means there is one essence and substance of God. God is one being who eternally subsists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so Christ was one in the substance and essence with God. And this is what he proclaimed when he was on earth, and that's why the Jewish religious leaders wanted to kill him. I believe it's John chapter 5. They said, we're, we're not going to kill you for uh, working a miracle, but we, we're going to kill you because you are a man, but you've made yourself equal with God. They understood exactly what the Lord was proclaiming. And it also says, and the word was with God, that word pros, it also depicts an intimacy with God or one who is face to face with God. Therefore, the word in this verse that was with God and was equal to God was in a face-to-face -face relationship with God. The Greek word pros. Or there existed an intimacy between the Father and the Son that's only understood by God. And in the Gospels, Jesus said that no man knows me except the Father. Nobody knows the Father except me. There's an intimacy there that nobody comprehends. They are distinct in person, but equally share one and the same substance of God. The same can be said of the Holy Spirit. And I don't care how much you claim to be Holy Ghost filled and fire baptized. No one comprehends that union, that intimacy between the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And then the last statement in John 1 is as clear as it can be. That this word of Logos was God. This word that was in the beginning was with God, on an equal plane with God, face to face with God, had an intimate relationship with God. The text is clear. This same word was God. And in the Greek language, this is written in the predicate form. 
And what that means is the emphasis is on the subject. The emphasis is on the subject. And the subject in John 1.1 1, 1 is the word. And so the emphasis is on the word. So the emphasis is not on who God is. The emphasis is on who the word is. And John and the Holy Spirit being moved by the Spirit answered. He said the word was God. Predicate form. The emphasis who the word was and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He was with God. And the word was God. Very clear. And there is no A, article A in there that would say he's a God. As did your whole witness that botched that up. Also notice it doesn't say and the word was one of many gods. Or one of three gods. No, the word was one and the same God as his father. There was one God, one being God. One substance and essence of God that eternally subsists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these three persons have an eternal love relationship that we don't understand. John 1 and 2 is clear that the word of the Logos in John 1 1 is a person. For he says he was in the beginning with God. The word he is the Greek word. It's, it's third person singular pronoun. Otos. It means a masculine person. The word was not a man. At this time. But the word was a masculine person. Who was there from the beginning. Was with God. And was God. You know there's heresy out there that God is a woman. Or that God is female. That is not the language of the Hebrew in the Old Testament, nor the Greek in the New. It's not there. That is more heresy created by man. In particular, uh, some feminist theologians who are trying to prove they're a woman by acting as much as they can like a man. But the fact that the word is a he, he was in the beginning with God, otus, third person singular pronoun, he, masculine. This totally negates the false teaching of the modalists or the sabellionists. And I'm going to talk about that a few sessions later. Who teach that the word that was in the beginning with God was not a person. He was just a thought in the mind of God. That's ridiculous. Because this word was not a thought. A thought is not a he, a personal pronoun. The word was a he, not an impersonal it or a thought. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He, Utos, was in the beginning with God. And then we jump down to verse 14. And we read that this same word in John 1, 1 through 2, who was in the beginning, was with God in an eternal face-to-face -face relationship, was the exact representation and image of God, and was God, became flesh or human. Specifically, an XY chromosome male who grew into a man. It reads like this, and the word became what? Flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And so the word in John 1, 1, who eternally existed with God and was God, became flesh. The word became, it's in the Greek second, it's a Greek second eros indicative. The word is eganato, eganato. It literally means to come into existence. Second person error was indicative. To come into existence. But it also means to come into existence once and for all. The thought is this from the Greek in that text. The eternal logos, a word. Who was in the beginning. 
who was in the beginning with God. The eternal Logos who was with God in a face-to-face -face relationship on the same plane of equality with God. And this word who was with God came into existence. In Ganeto, came into existence in human flesh. The Greek scholar Monts, it's on page 57. I have one of his Greek works here. I don't think I have it right at my hand. I think it's at my desk. He says this. Jesus coming into existence as flesh does not refer to his deity or the fact that he is God. But it speaks of the fact that he came to be human through the lineage of David, through the womb of his mother, Mary. God actually took on himself a human nature and was born. God was born through the womb of Mary. Yet he never ceased to be God. God took upon himself a human nature but never ceased to be God. This took place when the Holy Spirit overwhelmed his mother Mary and she came to be with child. Luke 1, 34-35 but Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Now listen, beloved. The same person who was the Word or the Logos who was in the beginning and was with God and was God became a man. Yet he never ceased to be God. Why? Because God cannot cease to exist. Why? God is eternal. No beginning and no ending. The eternal God of the universe, the word, the Logos, the one whom the Bible says God made all things through Christ, his son, that Logos, that word, and nothing was made that was made. God made it all through Christ, the Word. The Word who was with God in that face-to-face -face relationship. The Word who was on an equal plane with His Father. The Word who was with God. Predicate form. Remember that. The emphasis on who the Word was. The Word was God. He became flesh. In Igneto, He came into existence as a real human man, yet he had no sin nature. He had no sin. God walked amongst men in the person of Jesus Christ. He was God of very God, eternally begotten and not made. Yet he was truly human, yet he had no sin. This is the incarnation of God in Christ. God literally came into existence as the God-man and the man-God. Second Erewis indicative. Remember that. Second Erewis indicative. He came into existence in human flesh. And it means he came into existence once and for all. God became man but never ceased to be God once and for all. In Timothy, we read this written by Paul. There is one mediator between God and man. He says, the man, Christ Jesus. The word that was with God, was God and was God, forever took upon himself a human nature, but never ceased to be God. There were no two persons, God and Jesus, combining themselves at one another. No. Uh-uh. There was one person who took upon himself a sinless human nature, but never ceased to be God. So I want to make that clear. This does not mean God took upon residence in another person named Jesus. I know I'm being repetitive, but... We need to get this straight. 
The word of the Logos didn't take up residence in another person. No. The person, the word, the Logos, took upon himself, masculine, third person pronoun, utos. He took upon himself, God took upon himself, a human nature, but never cease to be God. This was something new. When God took upon himself a human nature, this was something new. And this is why in John 3.16, he's called the only begotten son. The term in the Greek is monogenes, the only one of his kind, the only one of his race. He was truly God, truly sinless man. God lived among men. God walked among men. And his disciples and others beheld his glory. Glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was God, a very God, truly God, truly man. The exact same person revealed as the word who was with God and was God in John 1.1. 1, 1. With the same person, the same eternal Logos. But he took upon himself a human nature once and for all. For when John says the word became flesh, remember, error was tense once and for all. I completed that. And so Jesus is forever the God man and the man God. There is a man in heaven who is truly God. There is a man in heaven who sits at the right hand of the father. Who is truly God. He's the God man and the man God. This is the incarnation of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. And we'll get into this a little later, I think, if I have time. You know, when the Bible talks about Jesus is the Son of God, well, it's two things. It was a title for the Messiah, but it speaks of the relationship between the Father and the Son. It's not talking about God bringing the son into existence as a human father begets a child. No, it's talking about the relationship between father and Jesus. It is a relationship of father and son, an eternal relationship with father and son. The Holy Spirit is an eternal relationship as comforter and advocate. It's deep, heavy stuff, but it's the truth. Jesus was one person with two distinct natures, the nature of God and the sinless, real, tangible person of flesh, blood, and bones, and everything else that makes a human, with the exception he had no sin nature, as we do, and he had no sin. And so the one who died for our sins was truly God, truly sinless man. That's why the Father was perfectly satisfied with what he did for us on Calvary's cross. God laid all of our sins on him. And on the cross, Jesus suffered and died. That's the suffering that we all deserve in hell. That's the torment we all deserve in hell. Jesus went through it on the cross as a real human Man, but that human man was also truly God. He was the God man. And therefore, he totally satisfied the Father as far as a payment for our filthy, disgusting, no good sins. And I'm included in that, and so is everybody else out there, including those of you who are hypocrites who really think you got it going on spiritually. You don't. I don't. The only one who's ever had it going on and was all that and then some was and is Jesus, truly God, truly sinless man, monogenes, the only one of his kind, the only one of his race, nobody like him. He's like us from the standpoint of being human, but he's not like us. 
he was truly God who took upon himself a sinless human nature. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the only thing worth shouting about. That's the only thing worth getting happy about is Jesus. Seriously. You know, got a lot of folks going to church on Sunday. They're getting happy over the music because it sounds good. It's the same as what happens at the club. Because it's not about Jesus. Because when it's come time for the preaching, they fall asleep. Didn't mean to go there, but I did. He's the only one of his race, the only one of his kind. Jesus Christ, the son of the true and living God. And most importantly, he will save you from all of your sin. The sin that dooms you to an eternal lake of fire. And I know we want to argue, is the fire real? What difference does it make? It's a place you don't want to go to. You know, Christians arguing over whether the fire is real, it's like arguing over whether you'd rather get shot in the foot by, with a 45 or a 44. What difference does it make? It's going to blow the foot off. Hell is torment, eternal torment. And the only one who can deliver you from that is this God man named Jesus. He died for you. He paid the price for your sin in full on the cross. And so if you're listening to this, you don't have any excuse. You don't have any excuse if you end up in hell and torment. You were told at least this one time. He died for you. He was buried. But God raised him from the dead. He stepped on a Shekinah glory cloud and sat down at the right hand of God. And right now, all power, all authority is in his hands. And my beloved, he can save you right now. The world is cruel. The world is harsh. The world is insane. And we all experience it in this world. That's part of the sacrifice for living in this world. You don't want to leave this world and step off into something much more harsh and much, much worse than this world. The only way to avoid it is a relationship with the Son of God. The one who is truly God, truly sinless man, died on the cross, buried, raised from the dead. The only way to be saved and to be delivered from eternity in hell and to spend your eternity in the conscious presence of God is through Jesus Christ. Admit that you're a big fat sinner. All messed up. All kind of sin. Some of it you're embarrassed and ashamed of. And quite honestly, some of that you need to keep it in the closet. But God knows what it is. Talk to him tonight. Tell God you know you're a sinner. You deserve hell. And then confess his son, Jesus, as Lord and Savior of your life. Believe on him. Trust in him. Believe that he died for you. He was buried and he was raised from the dead. And he can save you forever. Get on your knees or wherever you're at and invite him into your life. If you got a Bible, get it. You know, take it off the coffee table, dust it off, and turn to Romans chapter 10. Start at chapter 10, somewhere around read 8 through 9 at least. And it'll tell you how to be saved. Believe in the heart and confess with the mouth that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And the Bible says you will be saved. This is critical. I'm not talking about church membership. I'm not talking about this debate between reformed believers and non-reformed believers. I'm not talking about which spiritual gifts are in operations and which one of them that cease. I'm not talking about how you do church or how I do church or what kind of music we have. I'm not talking about you going to church on Sunday morning and getting your shout thing in or not getting your shout thing in. I'm not talking about bishop so-and-so and this, that, and the other, and all of that other nonsense. I'm talking about you and your relationship with God 
through his son, Jesus Christ. It is the difference between an eternity with God and one separated from God. In a place Jesus talked about more than anybody else in the Bible, it's called hell. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen, beloved. I preached a little bit. Didn't mean to do that. Just meant to teach. This is the incarnation of God. I have a part two that we're going to really be able to see through the Gospels how Jesus was one person with two natures. We'll see him as the God man and the man God. And then after that, I have a few things to say about this whole Bishop T.D. Jakes, these allegations, and it's not going to be what you think. And I already know what I've entitled it. It is not what should we think about T.D. Jakes right now. It's what we should have been thinking and preaching the moment he came on the scene years ago. If we have been doing what we needed to do as pastors, rightly dividing the word of truth, T.D. Jakes would not be who he is. And we wouldn't be having this discussion today about the allegations. I don't know if they're true or false. I don't know. I, I haven't seen the evidence. I don't know. It doesn't make any difference. If we'd have been preaching correctly, accurately, this wouldn't even be a discussion. It would be of no significance. So stay tuned for those two things. Uh, spent a little bit more time than I wanted to, beloved. But God bless you. And until the next time, good day, good night, good evening, or good afternoon.